My name is Lee George. I'm the director of marketing here at the James J. Hill Center. We are a reference library and nonprofit that works with entrepreneurs and businesses. We do about 160 programs a year. You're welcome to all of them. Uh, today we have this first in a series of discussions on funding and this the uh, idea for this really came out of discussions and conversations with all of you around wanting more education and information about funding resources here in Minnesota and how other entrepreneurs and businesses actually funded uh, their venture. And so a, a number of people, uh, including um, uh, Matt and Kathy and Brad and uh, Matt Ottersauter and a number of other people helped uh, put this together. So thank you all to them. It's been great. Uh, our first one today is on bootstrapping and early stage investment. And then our next ones are going to be every other week starting today. So the next one's May 6 on non-debt funding. I'll get information out to everybody about that. On this uh, piece of paper over here, that is our wireless network, JJ Hill Guest, the Guest Access, capital G and an at symbol our hashtag we're using, and then all of the Twitter handles, handles I had today for people. Please tweet uh, about this, and uh, we'll be following along on Twitter from the back of the room. Uh, so please do that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Segus, CEO and co-founder of Camera Slice, who is our facilitator today. Thank you so much. Cool. Go, Thanks. Uh, so start off, we're going to kind of break this down to what the format will be this morning. So typical panel, we would just ask a question, Q&A, something like that. We're going to change it up a little bit where we're going to actually have a timed based on the question. So I'll throw out a question. We'll go through the panel depending on if it's with investment or if it's startups, et cetera, and we'll time it. But then we'll stop and ask the audience to see if there's any follow-up questions to the question or if you'd like a particular person to stay on a particular topic because if it's interesting, we want to keep talking about it because this is actually for everybody in the audience. It's not about us at all. So uh, with that being said, again, my name is Matt Pasig. I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Camera Slice. We have a product called Slice Engine. It's a social as a service platform for mobile. We're targeting a, a B2B play. So with that, I'd like to pass it to Scott. If you could just introduce yourself, give us the elevator. Elevator pitch, Scott. Sure. Uh, good morning. My name is Scott Davis. I'm the CEO of Conquer, and it's spelled Q-O-N-Q-R if you're out looking for it. Uh, we're a mobile game, and uh, our game is like the board game Risk, but on the map of the real world, where our players battle for control of their hometown and surrounding cities. Uh, we've launched in the marketplace in March of 2012 uh, as a, um, a for-profit app. We had a beta for a year before that. And today we have uh, over 800,000 cities in every country in the world except for two in the middle of Africa. And we cover about 30% of the earth. I have three full-time employees and I hire um, on average anywhere from two to five subcontractors on a part-time basis each month. Yeah, my name is Dave Rusick. I'm a uh, managing director for Go for Angels. It's a an angel investor network, and what that means is we gather, right now we have 65 to 70 investors in our group, we gather them uh, somewhat like a shark tank, you get in front of the group and you do a pitch, and then uh, the group uh, within, the investors within the group will uh, form uh, interest groups to take a deeper dive into your company and to see if they want to invest. Uh, prior to that though, I think uh, this is relatively new, three years for Go for Angels, prior to that, um, I had uh, two businesses, uh, more capital equipment intensive type businesses, which might help answer some questions for some of you, depending on what businesses you're trying to start. Um, my name is Clarence. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Upsy. Um, and basically what Upsy does is we're disrupting the whole uh, consumer warranty, extended warranty industry. Um, we've been fortunate, we have a, a team of 10. And right out of the gate, we raised uh, $1.3 million in funding and seed funding, um, preparing for our A round. And uh, uh, we're just we're growing fast and, and trying to stop you all from getting screwed by the consumer, I mean, by the retailer. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Rick uh, Brimacombe. I have my own advisory practice, Brimacombe & Associates. 
Uh, prior to that, I co-founded a venture fund called Sherpa Partners. Earlier in my career, I was at uh, what was then Norwest Venture Capital, now called Norwest Venture Partners, that's out in California, and Norwest Equity Partners here in Minneapolis. Um, co-founded a number of companies over the years, so I've kind of been on the proverbial both sides of the table. Um, have a lunch group for entrepreneurs called uh, Club Entrepreneur, and then involved in a variety of other activities, Mojo, Minnesota, and so forth. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so just real quick show of hands, who in the audience is currently developing a startup, a business, et cetera, just by show of hands? Okay, so everybody, uh, keep your hands up for a minute. Who, if you have raised money, keep your hand up. So two, three, four-ish people? Okay, that's good, it's good to know. Um, so, so to kick this off, um, we've kind of had an earlier discussion about the definition of bootstrapping. I think to kind of start with that, um, Rick, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off, a definition of what bootstrapping is to you, um, and we're going to keep it to about a minute. I got the minute thing down. <laughs> Good. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, I guess to me, um, and the way the series was cut up, it, it broke down the different kind of fundraising paths. And when I saw this at bootstrapping, to me it meant anything you needed to do, the saying kind of by hook or by crook. So for me, bootstrapping just means get the job done. And that might mean that uh, you don't take funding, maybe you do take funding, uh, but you stretch your dollars. Um, and again, the, the definition to me is you're just going to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Clarence. Agreed. <laughs> that was great. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I look at uh, a couple of things that I've done in the past. Uh, I look at bootstrapping more, by my definition, without uh, partners and doing it on your own. Um, finding the funds, managing your money, uh, doing it uh, uh, leanly. Uh, and being very agile with how you do this because it's essentially your money or your family and friends money that's doing it. So I kind of or, uh, define bootstrapping in that way. Uh, I'm in the camp where bootstrapping to me is zero investors. Uh, if somebody has an equity stake because they gave you money, uh, that you're done bootstrapping at that point. You now have an investor. Um, we, we are that type of company. We don't have any equity holders in the company that didn't write code um, or uh, build graphic arts for us. We don't have anyone who was an equity holder because they gave us cash. And I'm in the same camp with Scott. So I think bootstrapping for our company was, I want to hold on to the equity as much as I possibly can until the right moment in time. It was actually way down on our list to actually raise money. And I haven't pitched to either of these gentlemen on the panel for a lot of personal reasons that I didn't want to come out talking about it or how I would want to raise. I mean, there's a whole, I have a very big opinion on that side of why I would want to try to raise money locally versus nationally and all that. Um, so a follow up on this, each four of you bright individuals here, um, have you raised money for a company of your own? Sounds like Rick has. David, I would also assume you've done the same. What kind of advice could you give the audience around that first initial, what, what type of position would I have to be in to consider uh, fundraising? Scott, I know you have an opinion on how you started the company, so. I'm going to hold mine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, I think the <clears throat> important thing is it's, there's a little bit, at some point, you, you may feel a bit desperation to, to get the money. And just remember uh, that uh, it is a marriage, so you want to make sure that your partners are going to work well with you. That means um, as difficult it is, as it could be is to turn down the, the offer if you don't feel like uh, your interests are going to be taken into account and that they're going to be good partners for you. And, you, and you're aligned. That's a big word, but you know, uh, within in that negotiation, is everybody aligned? Uh, be aligned uh, when you bring in outside money. That's yeah, good. Uh, just to follow up on that, so the being being aligned and when um, when it's a good time to bring in investors. You know, we I have a personal story that went with that where we actually had to say no to an investor because I felt like the terms and what was being discussed was just a little beyond at our current stage and then um, how would you describe or how would you kind of explain to the audience like 
if, if you're trying to raise money, what, what are some, the three things that come to your head? Let's just start with a three-point sermon on that. What are the three things that you would say that you need to have before you'd even consider outside investment? Uh, number one is a good attorney. Uh, don't assume that you can negotiate this thing on your own. Uh, a good attorney that's had a lot of experience, I think, is number one. Uh, and uh, number two, I think you need to, to write down what your personal goals are with this business. And the reason I say that is um, if you bring in uh, investors, their goal is to exit. Okay, so if you're looking at building a business that might be a legacy business or you want to be ahead of this business and make this a lifetime career, you're already not aligned with your investors. So you need to sort of define exactly what it is you want out of what you're trying to create. Another thing that we looked at, and the only reason we brought in investors, in our particular case, uh, in our strategy for our business, our business strategy was that we uh, knew there was a speed to market. And so we needed the money to quickly build this business or we were going to lose uh, our market to, to someone else with bigger bucks. So we thought that that was a critical factor in our decision to bring in investors. So those three things in our case were the motivations and things to consider. Great. Rick, would you have a, f a follow-up to that? Sure. Um, and I guess I uh, tying the first question in with this one, the bootstrapping with this one, I guess the bootstrapping for me would be how do you take one dollar, wherever you got that dollar, whether it's your dollar or someone else's dollar, and basically turn it into ten by being creative and pushing things forward and not paying full price and so forth. So how does that tie in with uh, getting money from someone else? Um, I think it's pretty clear uh, or pretty hard uh, to get money from someone else unless you're very clear, I mean like crystal clear as to what you're trying to do. And Clarence here was crystal clear with what he was trying to do going back a year or so or two years before he launched when I had some conversations with him. So being crystal clear on exactly what you're trying to do, um, some sort of proof uh, in, the, in what you're trying to accomplish and maybe it's a customer buying the product or maybe it's just uh, having an awareness of the market, but some kind of proof. It's not just a gut feel. It's not just your little something talking to you that, that, that you can point to. And then the third thing would be truly kind of understanding the dynamics of that market. I think a lot of people don't uh, fully appreciate kind of the undercurrent of what's going on. I see over and over and over people say, hey, we're going to go into a market and I'm going to sell them this gizmo and we're going to save them money. And the person they're trying to sell that product to is going to have to lay people off and those people are their friends. And so they don't understand kind of the undercurrent of what's going on. So the um, uh, kind of the back channels as to what's going on and why people buy, mm -hmm. I guess, would be the third thing. It sounds overwhelming. Sounds like you need a team of people to pull that off. I, I mean, in a perfect world, back to the first question, what's bootstrapping? In a perfect world, yes, you'd move the business as far forward as you can. Some things, you can't do that. Um, and other timing, um, like David said, timing pushes you forward. Um, do you need a team? Maybe. Uh, are you aware enough personally about the category that you can answer those questions? Maybe so. Um, are you better off with a team? Sure. Do you have to have a team? No. Okay. Thanks. Clarence or Scott, do you want to follow up with those? So uh, we did a lot of prep to attempt to raise money and, and finally gave up. And uh, within four to five months after that, we were actually cash flow positive and making payroll. So uh, it's not that we didn't attempt to raise money. In fact, we did a lot of research and a lot of prep. And so I, I have a couple of thoughts on uh, when to raise and, and is it the right time. Um, when you're looking at somebody that you might want to take money from, I would always evaluate whether you would want this person to be a partner in your business without the money. Um, if you wouldn't take them in your business without the money, you shouldn't take them with the money. Um, the uh, one of the things that um, I, worries me about companies that take money is that uh, money encourages you to make bad decisions. It encourages you to spend that money, uh, I don't want to say recklessly, but you buy things that you wouldn't have bought without that money. And so let's say that you spent a million dollars uh, to get your business off the ground. Um, can what you've done in, those, in, in the first six months of spending that million dollars get you to a million dollars in revenue? 
because you have to replace that money that you started spending um, so that you can continue your business operations. And if you can't get your business to replace that organically through revenue, then you're going to have to raise again, and you're going to have to raise again, and that can be a, a death spiral. Um, the, uh, the last thing that worries me about a lot of the investing that I'm seeing now, especially the news that you hear out of the Valley, is that the valuations for uh, first round early stage investing are, are just enormous. They're just through the roof, which really hurts your ability to exit. Um, because if you have a five or a 10 million valued valuation on your first round, think about how much revenue you have to be making for someone to want to be able to buy you so your investor can get a five to 10x return. Um, can your business even be a $100 million business? And with some of these early, early valuations that are happening in these early rounds, it actually can make it impossible for you to actually exit. Uh, you may have to try to reach for something that your business can never attain, and you'll, you'll end up killing yourself by, by reaching too far. Awesome. Any follow-up questions from the audience? Anybody in particular just on the topics and discussion? Anybody out there? Yep. Yeah, I'm curious, right? Seems like there are three people up there who say bootstrapping does not involve uh, uh, having a, an outside investor, and you say maybe it does. I'm wondering why y y you differ. <laughs> Can I go without the microphone? <laughs> oh, we have the camera. Okay, never mind. Um, that was actually something we talked about when I walked in. I said, I don't define the market this way, so it's just my opinion doesn't make it right or doesn't make it wrong. I think, again, bootstrapping to me means you probably don't have enough people. You probably don't have enough money, whether you took money from somebody else or not, and there's certainly not enough time to get it all done. So you're juggling. You're just trying, again, trying to get the job done. Clarence and I originally met in the basketball universe, and there are some players on the basketball court that just get the job done. They might not be the flashiest. They might not be the best, but they work hard, and they get the stuff done. So I guess from my perspective, bootstrapping means you're getting the job done kind of no matter how you do it. And um, I guess I'm, uh, whether that includes somebody else's capital, to me it'd be okay if you got a dollar from someone, it doesn't mean you go out and you buy some office furniture. So by stretching that dollar, to me, that's the definition. You're stretching the resources you have, people, time, and money to get the job done. I think it's just a, 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 like the, the tech community's kind of adopted that term. I, before I got into founding a, a startup, I, I, if I tell my, my wife, I want, you're bootstrappy. That's like that old saying like, oh, you hike yourself up with your bootstraps, right? That's, that term has been around for a lot longer. Now the tech community, I think, has just adopted it as meaning you are cash flow positive without outside, without any, uh, you just, you, you are selling a product for profit and you take that profit and you put it back into your business. And that's how you run your business without outside investment. That's the, th the definition I've seen it evolve. Or, or, you, or you got something else going on, kind of eight to five, and then you're working on nights and weekends to push the yep. ball forward, but again, I, to me, the definition would be just doing whatever it takes, and so I guess I think we're kind of splitting hairs a little bit, so. Yeah, I think the idea around doing whatever it takes, I think you have to understand yourself as a person, first of all, to know what that really truly means. There are people probably in the audience or ourselves that have taken more risk in defining what that risk means, like credit cards, going into debt, I'm gonna put my house up for sale, all sorts of different ways to do that. But I think understanding yourself as a person first to know what you would actually stretch yourself out to actually do. And I was talking to Tim earlier about this, having support network and all of the friends and family that can help you through that. It just depends. I mean, if you're a true, if you wanted to find a true entrepreneur, you're willing to take risk, I think, different than most people. So if it's pulling it off on nights and weekends, or doing it however, you're just gonna get the job done because you're passionate about what it is you're working on. So from an investment point of view, we're going through the bootstrapping, when is a good time, or what would, actually let me change the question, what would be uh, the top things that you'd say from an investment point of view that are just don'ts? You, you don't talk to investors. I think we kind of talked about the three things about that. Let's maybe reiterate that, maybe say it a little bit different. What are the three things that, no, you are not ready for this. Just why, why even think it right now? If it's the team, if it's the product traction, 
let's just say it one more time in a different way, if we could. Okay. Well, in some ways, I could just kind of take the inverse of the three things I just told you. But with that said, a uh, couple other things that come to mind. So um, somebody who doesn't understand the business model of whatever it is they're trying to do. Yep. So you may have a really cool idea, and it may be a market that's ready to be changed, and um, there might be a lot of reasons to do what you're doing, but you don't understand the economic model of you got to have something, you got to sell it, there has to be some enough margin in it to build a business. So somebody who can't kind of clearly define what the business model is, uh, to me, that's a problem. Um, I think the uh, um, a kind of an offshoot of the business model would be what you think you're going to accomplish financially can't be a top-down, hey, it's a $3 trillion market, and if we get one-tenth of one percent, we're going to be a really big company. That doesn't fly. How many transactions are you going to uh, conduct with whom? And I make, again, that goes into how much money you're going to make, but, but more of kind of the proverbial bottom up as opposed to top down. Uh, that would be two. And then um, I really don't like it when somebody comes to me and tells me it's conservative. So drop that word from uh, your uh, vocabulary because it's not conservative. It's the most kind of risky thing you could possibly do. And um, to, uh, to defend the uh, investment community, you need to make five or 10 times your money because a lot of them don't work. In fact, that's the little dirty secret that nobody wants to talk about is most of them don't work. So if you do 10 deals and five of them go to zero, seven, no, I mean, it's wor I mean, the dirty secret is that most of them fail, okay? But nobody wants to talk about that because it doesn't make the headlines. So the things that make the headlines are like buying the lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. So if you buy the lottery ticket and you think you're going to win, that's kind of what reading the headlines is. The reality is most of them don't work. So the investor has to make five, ten times their money because it has to pay for the ones that don't work. Okay, so some of you are too young to remember the record business, but in the record business, you needed a song to sell the record. Okay, you needed a hit song. The venture capital world is having a hit song to make the whole record work. No, I, I agree with Rick on, on this. Some of the things that we see, they're unrealistic business plans. Um, and, and the, uh, you know, I'm going to be the next Microsoft, uh, unlikely, because as you say, it's, it's a headline, and most of these companies won't reach that. Um, I think knowing your market, when you're in front of an investor and you're going to be quizzed about um, the market you're entering, we have no competition, well, that's, you know, that's one we hear a lot that's completely unrealistic. So know your market, knowing how, how you're going to grow it, and I think... Um, strong financial projections. And mind you, it's still, I was 20 years into one of my businesses, I would do projections for the following year and I would always be wrong. So, you know, even with experience in a, in a business, you can never uh, crystal ball gaze uh, and be right on the mark. But I think a realistic financial projection uh, that you can defend with your assumptions and bottom up, I agree with that, is really important for an investor because it helps them see that you understand what you're doing. So I, I, you know, a couple of things like that. Very good. We're going to switch it up here to uh, skin in the skin in the game here. So, as a founder, and as investors, and as the startups, can we talk about skin in the game? What does that term mean to you? And what type of skin have you put in your game? Um, so, Scott, at, what at Conquer, skin in your game? Yeah, I'm I'm missing some. Um, at Conquer, we had three partners that uh, quit their jobs and went full-time. We did some part-time consulting for the first year that we were trying to get a product out the door. And um, I personally, uh, my maximum I was ever in debt on my home equity line was 45000 um, But that was a, a wavering number where I would pay what I could and draw back. So I don't know what the total amount would have been on that, um, if I would have kept track of it over time. But I know that at my at my deepest, I was 45 grand in. I'm, I'm now back to zero on that. Um, but I uh, haven't taken a paycheck since December. So I, I hired another employee, gave up my salary to get another person in the door. So there's more skin in the game there. Um, and so that will, and, and if, uh, if we don't increase our revenue to pay for that salary, I'll be going in debt again um, to pay my mortgage by August. 
So there's risk that's associated with that. I don't mm -hmm. know what my other two partners did. Um, I know that they probably were very similar to where I was in terms of um, their debt structure, um, which forced them out of the business as a full-time role and back into a job. So now of the founding partners, I'm the only one that still works full-time in the business. Um, the, the others are uh, somewhat engaged, but not, not full-time anymore. Um, so that's skin. Um, the other way that you lose skin is through sleep. I slept five hours, five hours last night, uh, four hours the night before. My, my work day usually ends after midnight um, and is almost always seven days a week and, and for no salary. I went 15 months without a paycheck. Well, and to also be clear, you're doing something in, in gaming, but you're also supporting how many people in the community? In, in, in terms Conquer, of, in, yeah. In how terms of how big is the community? Or, yeah. Or, or no, the actual players, uh, players the, the actual community um, that's using the product. It, it's we've we've had over we're we're approaching oh, about a half a million downloads, perhaps. Um, for us, the number of players is weird compared to most gaming companies, because most mobile games are two weeks and I'm done. Um, Twenty percent of my players have been playing for more than a year, and so when you look at two weeks and you multiply that times twenty six two week periods in a year, um, my player base is actually uh, a multiple of 20 of my actual player base because of the longevity of my player. So when people come to us and say, oh, how many players do you have? <laughs> it's not a fair metric because we don't measure up against other mobile games. We're more like a World of Warcraft engagement where people play for years as opposed to an Angry Birds type of engagement. But we're in literally every country in the world. Um, there's 200,000 cities in the United States, which is twice the number of zip codes. So we have extremely high saturation. Hmm. And 99% of those cities in the United States have been captured in our game. And you have to be within 30 miles of the city to capture it. So yeah. that gives you a little bit of an idea of the saturation that we have. Yeah, I can echo exactly the same thing. Um, I hope this doesn't dissuade you people from starting your business, but uh, 90 hour weeks, uh, putting uh, all my assets on the line, uh, if things crashed and burned, I, you know, be, uh, could essentially be out on the street to get a family to feed and all that kind of thing. But if you don't have the stomach for that kind of thing, then don't do it. Because, and that's bootstrapping. That's skin in the game and bootstrapping right there. So, uh, what can I say? That's Is bootstrapping really necessary? Have you ever run into a situation, David, where you've funded a company where you're just like, yeah, that's amazing, and they had no skin at all. You're just, we're funding this thing. No, you know, uh, yes. And when I say, I'm talking about my network, not me personally. Okay. People within the network have done that. But I think there's uh, some comfort in the, in the idea that if a company you're going to invest in uh, earlier took money from, say, the founder's mother, uh, it gives you a little sense of, you know, that he's not going to let this thing fail because he's not going to screw his mother over. And so it's well, that. So <laughs> <laughs> Depends well, right. on the mom, I guess. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to my mother. <laughs> but anyway, um, no, I think that's what I call skin in the game because you have it all in to some extent. And if you have family and friends, uh, this means you're going to do your best to make sure this thing doesn't fail. And that means getting four or five hours of sleep in the evening uh, because you're up there working your ass off to make this thing mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. so. What do you think, Clarence? What was the question? Skin in the game. Skin in the game. How did, yeah. you, how did you approach that with, with Upsy? How did, that, how did that tie into it? Um, you know, I, I think us and our team, you know, before we raised our funds, you know, there was no eating, there was no sleeping. Um, you know, very similar to these guys. You know, I, luckily I got a wife that supports me, but, I, you know, I think the thing that we're not, that hasn't been said yet is the strain that it takes on your family and your relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I know my wife, she, I mean, when, when, you, when you don't have food and you have a kid on the way and, you know, all those things are happening, I um, mean, you, you're telling her to believe um, that that's the probably the biggest skin in the game that I, you know I put my relationship at risk um, to work 90 to 100 hours a week and, and make this work. Yep, I ex explain it to my wife personally. Like this is a phase, right? This is going to last for three months, and then pretty soon month six comes around, and she's like, "Honey, well, you said three months, right?" Right. Uh, yeah, I think my wife figured out about week number two that this wasn't no phase. We were, <laughs> we were working. So, um, 
so you know, those are the, the, the biggest tolls, and I think you know, you know, for us, once we raised the money, it was it was keeping that same fire under our butts every single day. Like we didn't have a dollar in the bank and, and spending it wisely, right. and um, really being respectful of our investors and the the money and the time that they were putting into us. So you're saying it's not easy. It sucks. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think sometimes we get we make this look very glorious. You know, we get to sit up here and, and talk to really smart people, but. Um, um, it's not easy. It sucks every single day. Even when something right happens, you know that three wrong things are coming. Um, and so, uh, yep. you know, we, <laughs> we're fighting every day. All right, what's the next wrong thing that's going on? Right. Can, can I ask a question? Yep. I want to know, uh, can you give us the timeline on your business before you took money? Like what kind of profit or scale did, were you at before so, you took money? So in our business, we spent about 18 months before we raised any money just fighting our industry. So okay. we, we didn't have no business going. It was all about could we get to market? Right. Uh, because we knew once we get to market, um, there was a big opportunity. We were first movers. Um, so our investors came in knowing getting to market, these guys have a, a huge opportunity in front wow. of them. Wow. So you were able to raise, you. you you had to raise before you even got to market. Uh, I don't think we had to raise. I think we did it because you did. You know, very similar it, to what Dave was talking about earlier. We knew we were first movers. If somebody else so would have just jumped on it, yeah. Well, not even that somebody had jumped. We knew we wanted to go out and we wanted to win the race, mm -hmm. um, and the race was was long and it was going to be treacherous. And we knew that just from you know dealing with the industry. Right. So um, we raised because we we wanted to win and we wanted to win quickly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that don't want you around. <laughs> there, there is, but uh, as I like to say to them, I'm not going to say that back. <laughs> <laughs> Screw I like, them. I like it. <laughs> Couple, uh, just real quick things on yep. the <clears throat> skin in the game. Is that all right, Matt? Yep. All right, so uh, who knows the original story of the Rainforest Cafe? Okay. A couple hands, not many. Okay, Steve Sussler, if you've never met him, kind of larger than life guy. He actually built the original Rainforest Cafe in his house with parrots flying around and rain <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. So he was all in, all right? So now, the skin in the game, he, he had some financial resources to do that, but that guy literally built the first Rainforest in his house, okay? So that's a skin in the game, that's how he got money. He brought people to his house, and they're like, if you're crazy enough to do that, you know, you're gonna be able to pull this off. So anyway, that came to mind. Uh, something else, an uh, entrepreneurial couple um, that I've done some work with over the last couple of years, they put about 800000 into their software company, and um, that was a substantial part of their net worth. Uh, they had an exit, and they kind of, in essence, rolled it all over. Um, but what I told them was, that's a lot of money, and that should be part of your pitch, saying, we put 800000 in it. So that would be another definition of kind of skin in, skin in the game. But then to balance that off, there's a woman who um, I've kind of been mentoring or <coughs> helping over a four or five year period. And at one point, this woman uh, was homeless. And this woman had some serious chemical dependency issues and was basically coming up off of the bottom lost her lost her family or kids lost like everything and i have been spending time with her over a multi-year period and she's been kind of climbing back up climbing back up and uh, i hooked her up with an entrepreneur for this idea that she's kind of been incubating for several year period and this entrepreneur is kind of on the verge of joining her and i said if you can get him to join your business the best thing that's ever happened to you in your life so skin in the game has a lot of different definitions, um, and it really again goes to you know how motivated are you and how dedicated are you and at what lengths will you go to get the job done, which goes back to my definition of bootstrapping, which is with or without money, you just do whatever it is uh, that it takes. Awesome. Any follow-up questions with the audience, Jim? Yeah. I kind of want to make a, a statement because I think the majority of this audience are aspiring entrepreneurs. And so all of the things that you're talking about um, may, you know, come across as, um, you know, experienced people here. But the the idea of skin in the game to the investor uh, from the aspiring entrepreneur, most aspiring entrepreneurs think, I have an idea. The very first thing I need to do is get money. And they don't have skin in the game. Um, they think the idea is 90%, and I, I think 
skin in the game is a valid question from investors, and I and I find it, you know, with my exposure to aspiring entrepreneurs, they don't want to talk about it. So um, I think your uh, position as an investor to ask that forward question up front um, is is very valid. So I think it'd be interesting to to do this. This was an article that came out about two weeks ago, and they pulled some of the most sexiest startups in the Bay Area about five things, and they asked him, put these in order to what was the most important. And those five things were the idea, the team, the business model, funding, and timing. So I think we'll kind of have this as a discussion, obviously, but uh, what do you think in order, what would be the first, the very first thing out of those five? And they were once again, the idea, the team, business model, funding, and timing. Go ahead, Rick. What do you think would be the first? Very tough question. Uh, I guess first and foremost to me would be the team and the people. However, as soon as I say that, I would say, well, guess what? If you have a business model and the way this is written here, clear path to revenue, if you figured out something that works, you're going to be able to attract a team, you're going to be able to attract money, you're going to be able to attract stuff. So um, oh, um, older guy in uh, New York originally from Texas is saying that I've said for a long time, are the dogs eating the dog food? If you figured something out where the dogs are eating the dog food, you're going to be able to put it together. And then the last thing, so I'm giving three uh, of the five, uh, when I see timing, um, there is uh, nothing wrong with having a little luck on your side. And likewise, you can do everything right, and um, you're in a boardroom in the morning of 9-11 looking to have some documents signed, and, which I was. Documents didn't get signed, the thing didn't happen, and you know, I mean, you need to have some luck. So I guess uh, I'm gonna go 1A, team, 1B, business model, and 1C, timing. Awesome, thanks. Clarence, what do you think? Traction was not on the list. And this is a real article too, and um, we'll talk to Lee about sending this out. I think this is kind of a, it's an interesting article. Yeah, I think, and you, I think you hear this a, a ton. Um, you know, we all have 21 ideas while we're in the shower, right? Like, <laughs> everybody has an idea. Ideas don't mean shit. Um, uh, you know, for us, it was about, you know, and when, you, when we were sitting talking to investors, you know, yeah, they wanted to hear idea, but they wanted to hear how you were going to execute on the idea. And did you have the knowledge base to execute on the idea, not just you and your, and your team? So, um, you know, I'm a big believer in idea and team are they should go together. Yeah, great idea, but you should also have a great team. Um, the funding will come, and then, you know, you figure out the business model. Things move. I think, as David said before, you know, when you write out uh, your P&L sheet and, and all your projections, they're all wrong anyway, right? You're making them up. Um, you don't know what you're going to do. I think the big ideas just kind of go with the flow and figure things out as they go and pivot as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I know for us, we just recently went through this where, you know, we wasn't growing fast enough at our pace, and literally we stopped our, our marketing campaign one day and just pivoted. Um, that's been really good for us. So um, idea and team are, are, are the same to me. Um, then funding and then everything else will we'll figure itself out if you're working hard enough. Cool. David? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Clarence on the idea. I think that we see a million and one ideas, and uh, if, if the other things don't line up, that idea doesn't go anywhere. So I, I, I'm surprised they put that number one. I would put that, I wouldn't even, I don't even know where that. Oh, and they're not in order oh, okay. by the actual poll. This is a very discussion. I would put that in number 10. Opinion. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I would do, you know, it's great to have an idea, but I think uh, what I don't see on here is, is uh, you, you know, your business model uh, to me is important, but what that means is that you have to do, I believe in research. And I think it's uh, the the it's the lean startup model, um, launch pad. I believe mm -hmm. anyway, um, where you go out and you really do a lot of the research prior to even building your model because of discovery, You're talking to your customers, talking to stakeholders, uh, getting all the information you can 
to create a business model. And then you'll know what you need on your team because you're going to find out what you're missing in, in your business model and what do you need to shore up that, that what skill you don't have. Uh, timing's important, but again, I think in research, uh, the, the stuff you do before you start your business will tell you if you're too early, too late, who else is out there discovering competition that may not, you may not be aware of, but you better be, uh, or if you're too early in some cases and that you're going to have to do a lot of pioneering. So on all of this, I would start with, uh, I know it wasn't on the list, but I would start with uh, doing your research uh, before any of these uh, because then they'll all feed into the rest of this. Are you going to need funding? Your research will tell you if you're going to need funding at this mm -hmm. thing because you'll build your financial model and it'll tell you if you're going to need a million dollars to do what you're going to do or you can bootstrap or uh, rather than calling it bootstrap like you guys did, grow organically. Um, so anyway, that's that's my okay. two Thanks, cents. Thanks, Stephen. Scott, um, I, I'm going to put <clears throat> idea down at number 10. Um, a lot of really awful, terrible ideas generated a lot of money. Um, and I assume that if you're going, getting any traction at all with your uh, desire for a startup, your idea is at least s sort of viable. Um, the team is over 50%, uh, if you were to stratify this, is, is the biggest part of this whole concept. Um, no doubt about it, because it comes down to execution. And then the model goes along with that. And when I always look at models, I'm looking at, can this business actually make money? Um, we're seeing a really, what I think is a bad trend right now, which will be the, not, the next dot-com bust of evaluating, can I get users, um, thinking that a user is worth a dollar. And we all know from the dot-com that a banner ad click is not worth a dollar, which is what caused the first dot-com. And now we're evaluating companies based on how many millions of free users they have, um, not based at all on how much revenue they have. And so I think your model of can you make money or are you making money is probably number two there. Um, I think funding falls in third place because uh, whether that's money that you're making organically through your revenue or you have to get, at some point you, you have to have the funding um, even if that is of your own volition. And uh, uh, just above the idea, I would place the timing. I think a lot of people um, have to, they, they think they have to be first to market and not discounting Clarence here who, who mentioned that earlier, but I, I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who say, I have to be first, I have to be first, and, I, and I'll ask them, how much of the market can you capture if you are successful with your plans? And they'll say, oh, 5% or, or 10%. And so that leaves a lot left over. What if somebody else is before you and gets 10%? There's still 90% for you to go grab as well. And so the idea that you have to be first, um, it does happen for startups, but it's often not as real as a lot of mm -hmm. entrepreneurs think it is. Right. <clears throat> so, yeah, feel free. Um, I think you're 100% right. Um, <clears throat> before Facebook, there was what's MySpace and all those guys, right? I, I think each industry kind of tells the story of does it matter if you're first or does it matter if you're last, actually, so you can learn from those first people's mm -hmm. mistakes? Um, so I, I, I agree with you. So I'm going to shock you a bit. <clears throat> the article actually had 42% uh, on timing was the number one thing. Now, these were startups like Uber, Facebook, Dropbox, things like that. That's what they actually had put first. The most important thing was the timing, and the very last was the idea, which is interesting. Yeah, but you know, I also think it's interesting that companies that are multi, multi-billion dollar companies can make those comments because they're already there, <laughs> right? So, so I think sometimes they forget when they were a startup and they were eating revenues. But I think, we found, I think we found something to talk about here. I think we can go a little bit deeper on these five pieces. So if we're going to talk about the idea, why that is least important, and I think each one of you kind of hit it already, but why? Why is there so many ideas as entrepreneurs? What could you give for advice for all of us around the shoot it down methodology. The, um, to be honest, when I was doing in, in the um, kind of the development tech world where I would actually be a tech therapist, I talked to hundreds and hundreds of clients about their idea and I was named the dream smasher. That was my nickname. And all the salespeople really liked me because they could throw me on a phone, talk to somebody and gently tell them yeah, 
you, which pill do you want to swallow today? The red or the blue that costs this? So if you could give any advice to us as entrepreneurs, how would you kind of approach that idea? Like, that's a really good idea, but what things would you tell that entrepreneur that they should actually do? Like, what would be those, I, I mean, for me, I would tell somebody, have you, have you tested this? What's the market? What's the research? Have you done, have you done your due diligence on your own? Did you, did you build a prototype? Did you, did you test this? I mean, that would be the things I would say. But in your opinion and from your each different world, um, how would you approach that? Uh, I think the big problem that I'm seeing uh, kind of paralleling, paralleling to that question is I'm seeing a ton of entrepreneurs just build products or just have an idea and there's not really a problem there to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing that a ton across the board, no matter what industry they're in, people just building products and saying, let's go find somewhere to stick it. And you know, so for me, when I'm sitting and talking to any entrepreneur, um, I try to be as honest as possible, right? Because I think the great thing about entrepreneurship is it sucks 90% of the time, so when somebody adds 1% to that, eh, you're fine. Um, I think most ideas suck. I mean, that's just the kind of the honest, the God truth of it. I, uh, very rarely do I see an idea and say, oh, you know what, that, that has legs. Or it's so early that I'm not smart enough to see the trend. You know, I had an investor sit down with me and say, out of the valley and say, well, we passed on Airbnb. And, and now they're $10 billion and, you know, we're not very smart. I said, first of all, why are you telling me that? Because you make, you make yourself look stupid to me. <laughs> but um, two, I, I think that ideas sometimes manifest themselves you know, over time, there's some ideas that are great in the beginning. How would you test that idea to know that I need to continue with this? I mean, is it, there's a difference between a good idea and passion. Yeah, I, right? I think the market will tell you. If you do your research and you take the time to really look at the market and not look at it through the lens of, I want to go into this market and try to win. If you look at how, talk to customers, you know, we talk to hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of customers before we had a product, before we had anything. What do you think? Um, if you do your research, most time the market will tell you don't do it, or mm -hmm. either you really need to do it. Okay, Rick. I'm not sure this exactly gets to the question as it was asked, but I was thinking about um, trying to decide good idea, bad, um, and why maybe ideas aren't they valued. And kind of thinking back, I started writing uh, investment research in 1987, like three lifetimes ago practically to do then what people can do now cost millions of dollars so um, in various talks I've given I've talked about a deflationary period to do a startup mm -hmm. what that means more people are doing them and the value of the startup and the idea are less so to kind of rise above the noise, you have to do more and you have to be more special and so forth. Um, so anyway, to, to hmm. get to the, the, the spot, cost less and can happen more. So there's just the, the space is more crowded. The other change that's happened is back then, people were going to work at big companies and kind of looking at the world through that lens. Now the whole entrepreneurial thing is... Um, in some ways, I don't know if glorified is the right word, but it's looked mm -hmm. at differently. So again, speaks to the idea being of less value because there's more of them. So I think there's just dynamics driving uh, what's happening, um, and it means it's tougher for somebody to come up with a good idea and get attention. Very good. Scott? Looks like you have something to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard to come up with a worse idea than starting a game company. So, <clears throat> um, but I, I think that one of the things that I see when I talk to entrepreneurs about their idea is a lot of people um, trudge down the path where the solution they're building is more expensive than the pain. And, and that's a big problem is that what would, it, what would you have to charge for this product, for the service to be profitable? And is someone willing to pay that um, to eliminate their pain point? Every idea solves a problem. The question is, is you know, is the problem big enough to solve? And um, there's always going to be somebody who has the same pain that you have. Uh, can you find them? How hard is it to find them? And, and how hard is it to pull the money out of their pockets? Um, mm -hmm. If you're going after something like um, an educational institution, what's their 
their sales cycle? Is it a year? Is it two years? Um, how hard is it to get that money out? And uh, my advice to the entrepreneurs out there who have ideas is, is don't spend money to test your idea. I, I see way, way, way too many entrepreneurs burning their early capital to prototype. Um, if you have to spend money to prototype, don't do it. That means that you're missing a, a technical partner on your team who can do this for sweat equity. Um, I, it's, we had a beta that could not generate any revenue for a year. And we said, well, we'll see if anybody uses this thing. And our prototype pulled us out of our day jobs. Um, we didn't quit our day jobs to go build a product. We built a prototype and threw it out there and see if anybody would use it. And only after we saw the insanity of, of some very OCD players playing our game 18 hours a day that we decided, okay, there's something here and we can pursue this. And so test your idea for free. Make that test pull you out of whatever it is that you're doing today. David, do you have any response to that? Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I, uh, mixed, I have a mixed message. I've uh, had uh, currently working on a project now and then the two previous, and the two previous, we ran across people say, oh, uh, you know, this is a horrible idea. But we kept slogging away at it and proved out that it, it could work. Uh, so that's, in a way, that's a bad message to give to you. I think the best thing, again, I'll go back to research. Um, I think, uh, so currently, uh, the project I'm working on, I did go visit customers. I spoke to people that are uh, broadly called stakeholders that to get some feedback, and, and I've had to make changes, make changes um, at the same time, continuing to slog on this thing. But I think you need to be open-minded um, if you're if you're hearing negatives, find out what the negatives are. Can you overcome them? Uh, but I do believe, as Scott said, um, before you make the big investment, find out what's you know, uh, find out if your idea has has legs uh, before you do that, and you're not wasting your time. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to take gospel from somebody saying that it's not going to work. If they're saying it's not going to work, why isn't going to work? Can you overcome that? But be honest with yourself. If you can't overcome that, then maybe it's time to drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. But mm -hmm. again, I go back to the research uh, mm -hmm. to do all this prior to investing. Then it's only time, which is valuable. But at least it's not your cash. So mm -hmm. do that. And then I love the idea. We're currently with our project now working on the prototype because of what we learned going yep. through our research, which changed a lot of things. We originally were going to go for the big the big thing now we're down to a little prototype because we uh, so many questions came up that we didn't anticipate through our research. So I go back to research. Yeah, and around the idea part, I think there's a few things we can follow up with is one, I would suggest that anybody who comes up with an idea, I would say come up with 10 derivatives of the one idea and go after and test little markets or little niches because, you know, if you're going to respond, we're going to take down Facebook. Okay, that's not happening. I think I counted my time when I was talking with clients. I don't know how many times that came up. We're building a Facebook competitor. You got to be kidding me! No, that's not that's not good. A good idea. I uh, wanna, can I pile on top of that? Yeah. If your idea includes the words "the next" right. or "killer," <laughs> go go back to the drawing board. Yeah, uh, that, that's you don't want to be the next to anything, and you'll never be the killer. Um, you know how many eBay killers there were in the dot-com boom, and you know how many Facebook killers there iPhone are now? killers. Twitter killers, uh, Instagram killers. Um, be something else. Be the first of something. Don't be the next or be the killer. And I think around the, the marketing and the testing part of it, I'll, I'll tell a quick little story, and then we'll move into, um, I think, a discussion around uh, the team aspects. When we were creating our first initial prototype for camera slides, it's a technology that synchronizes devices, as simple as that. So what did we do? We built a prototype. Uh, we went to a festival, a music festival, because we thought we were building a consumer app. So we were like, oh, we're going to build this really great consumer app. We're going to be like the better than Snapchat, right? Not the next Snapchat, better than them. So we went and tested this. And we're sitting in the production trailer, no Wi-Fi, no LTE. Our group was able to synchronize devices and capture 12 gigs of data, which is really great for quantification if I were going to raise money on, that, on those numbers. What did you come away with? The best thing we came away with was that was fun. I enjoyed the experience, but there's no problem 
I'm solving. It's really fun. So Scott can talk about fun in a different way, I'm sure. Uh, but what we ended up realizing, I'm looking around in the production trailer and I'm watching people coming in and out of the production trailer, these professional photographers, they're collecting pictures, turning around, giving it to the production team, and that took 20 to 40 minutes for them to do this process. And I said, holy crap, we could solve this in two minutes. And I could crowdsource all the content from all the phones that are in the crowd. That's interesting. So our idea completely shifted from, I'm now gonna sell a B2B tool to all these different apps, which again, I would never say this, that we're gonna supply all the apps. No, we're gonna target these niche areas because the pain that I'm seeing in these areas around producing content, crowdsourcing content from everybody here in the audience, that's where I idea, and I am not kidding, less than 24 hours completely shifted into something completely different than we had ever thought of. And we're shifting again. And guess what? We're gonna shift one more time. And we're actually rebranding. We're making our message clear. So I think if we're taking the idea and we think there's legs, keep testing it, keep proving to yourself, and make sure you shoot it down. I'm not kidding. That, I think, is one thing maybe we didn't say, is like, kill it. Literally just stop. Pull the plug. Disband the entity, whatever you need to do. I think that's really important that you have that, that release. People that will shoot your idea down, but give you the reasons why they're shooting it down. I think the, the culture here sometimes is, I don't want to see somebody else win, so I'm going to shoot their idea down because mm -hmm. I don't want to see them win. Um, versus having a group of mentors and partners that shoot your idea down but give you the right things to do. And I think um, sometimes that's scary for an entrepreneur because you, you know, you're living and dying and working 100 hours a week and somebody says, that sucks. Um, that's really hard to swallow sometimes. So yep. uh, I think it's about finding people that will shoot your idea down with love. Yeah, and challenge Yeah, you. and actually, Rick, I want to ask you a question. Um, do you mentor any startups, entrepreneurs, I'm sure you, you do, but could you tell us like what, what kinds of advice you'd give from a mentorship or advisor to an entrepreneur and then to a team, a startup? How are those two different that you'd say to the entrepreneur, CEO type person versus the team startup? I think every situation is unique. I mean, um, talking to somebody who was as low as being on the street is a different mentoring role than somebody who's got money in the bank and trying to do the next thing. So I, I, every, everything's a little different. Um, every dynamic is a little different. Every team is a little different. Um, with that said, um, I kind of jokingly tell people it's a little bit like being a marital counselor and there's only so many things that couples fight about, right? You got money, you got family, you got sex, you got kids, you got household chores and maybe one or two more, but that's probably about 90% of the problem. So uh, <laughs> pre-startup. <laughs> um, Anyway, so uh, you know, most people go through the same challenges, um, and so, but I, I guess my job and my role with folks is to try to listen and, and pick up the things that are unique to them and try to focus on them. So I, I don't know if I could give a, a blanket kind of answer to that. Okay, then let's get more specific then. So if you were gonna tell CEO, um, you just heard the idea, let's say you like it, mm -hmm. What would be the next logical? I mean, we've, we've answered this in a, a plethora of different ways, right? The team, the financial, all of this. But let's just say all of that is good and you're like, this is a go. What, what would you say to that person? What's the next step? What's the next kind of must do for somebody? Yeah. Yep. Well, piggybacking on the uh, research question and the um, other things that were kind of circling around that part, um, I, you know, when we were asking the top five, which one's the top five, the, the business model getting traction, I would say, okay, yep. how do we get a customer? So when we look back at the Sherpa investments, the investments in companies that had a customer were way better than the ones who we're doing from scratch. So um, I would say, all right, well, let's go get a customer because guess what? That's also a way to bootstrap it. Mm. If you get somebody mm -hmm. to pay for something, that's better than trying to get a dollar from an investor and maybe even get somebody to pay something ahead so you cut them a little bit of deal to be your first customer or to, to pay one year in advance or what have you. So. Um, 
I'm big on the transactions, I'm big on the customers, and that's the one thing that you can quantify. So back on something I said a little earlier about the dogs eating the dog food, if there's something you can do to help understand whether the dog's eating the dog food, um, I'm all for that. And then something else I say over and over to people is being wrong and being early look exactly the same. Okay, let me say it one more time. Being wrong and being early look exactly the same. So how do you know the difference? You gotta sell a product, a service, and it only has to be one because you'll learn something, what everybody said, you learn something and then you tweak it. Right. Yep, go ahead, Clarence. Um, so my message to entrepreneurs out there, you know, these guys are really smart and much respect to all the investors in the world, but I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, we hang our hat on what an investor says to us. And the truth of the matter is, they're not any smarter than we are or you guys are. So um, they have more experiences, they may have more money in the bank, but from a, uh, this is my business, I understand what's going on, I've done the research, I've done all the work. Uh, I know this business 50 times better than any uh, investors I've sat down with. So I would encourage every entrepreneur, like it's great to meet with investors and get their opinions, um, but don't hang your life on what they have to say. They're, they're, mm -hmm. They put their pants on just like us in the morning or skirts or whatever. <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. Uh, uh, my business would have died probably five or six times had I listened to the industry experts and investors that we got advice from. Um, and I'll give you the most poignant example for my business. I'm a mobile gaming company. Um, two thirds of my users and two thirds of my revenue come from Windows Phone. Anyone here shocked at that? Right? We, we talked to industry experts who said, look, all you want to do is iPhone, that's it. No Android, you, you'll, you'll, you'll break even maybe on Android, and Windows Phone doesn't exist. And that advice is great advice if it comes with a check for a million dollars. But it's only good advice if it comes with a check to go out and buy the iPhone users. You don't get iPhone users for free. You have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to go buy those users. And if you don't have that money, it's, it's not good advice, and here's why. There are more, there's millions of Windows Phone users. I can't reach them all. There's no way I can reach them all. So if I can't even reach the entire smallest market, it doesn't matter how big the market is. I can go into any of them and, as my start. And so um, I can get Windows Phone users for free, and that's what has gotten my company off the ground. Mm -hmm. And so exactly what Clarence is saying here is that Yes, absolutely. Talk to experts, talk to advisors, talk to investors, get their ideas, but their advice is, is not gold. You, have, you know your business, you know your market, you know your perspective, and you have to gauge whether the advice really is meaningful to you and, and take the opinion of where are these guys coming from. They're coming from the point of view of they've never worked with a business that didn't have millions in capital because that's the only businesses they deal with because they invest in them. And so they're going to do things very, very differently because they have different resources at, at their disposal. If you don't have those resources, if you are, are thinking you're going to bootstrap or if you're forced to bootstrap, you have to take the lens that they're looking through and, and determine whether that applies to you or not. Okay. David? Yeah, I'm completely insulted and I'm leaving. <laughs> no, I, you know, as the entrepreneur side of me, uh, two things. One, I, I think it's good to um, agree somewhat with what you're saying. Take, listen to what they're saying. Uh, have them challenge your, your thinking is, is, and then evaluate it. Um, you're right. A lot of these, you know, I've got, again, I'm up like Rick on both sides. But uh, I've seen, um, here's an, an investor thing. I, I'm looking to invest in disruptive businesses. And then we get a disruptive business, so, somewhat like yours actually, that comes in and then they're afraid because now you're going to be coming up against entrenched stakeholders, which you're dealing with now. So I, I back off because it's going to take too much. So two sides of the coin mm -hmm. there. So I mm -hmm. agree somewhat with what you're saying, but I, on the other hand, listen, uh, evaluate, let them challenge your thinking because you'll come out better in the long run. Yeah, That's all. And I would say there's another, maybe we can call it a Minnesota thing, but just from my <clears throat> talking to lots and lots and lots of companies and entrepreneurs, um, this whole idea of build it and they will come. 
Yeah. That's, that's a great answer. Um, because it's, it's not true. Just because I build something doesn't mean it attracts. Now, that, that time had its place in time. And when that was a first to market kind of opportunity for, I think, the perfect example for that, and it's also not, was the Angry Birds game that just made billions and billions of dollars. And we're like, wow, that was their 40th title before they even saw that. So the whole idea of like, I'm just going to build this product, throw it out there. What, what is the stat now? I think gaming is the most um, built app, I believe, type of genre. I think there's 600 released a day. If, is that stat still true? Is that right? For just gaming in general. I mean, just apps. The idea of, I'm going to build a particular app. Let, let's say I'm going to build a competitor to Upsy where I'm going to start building something with warranties and go after that market. Now, there's, there's competition there, no doubt. So if I just release a competitor, you know what? Oh, yeah. Okay. So in that perspective, um, and you started off with gaming, um, I heard a stat from uh, a gaming expert who I know and respect um, very strongly just a week ago that 600 new games hit iTunes every, every day. Um, you, you just can't build a game and throw it into a market like that and just expect that people... But I'm the next supercell. So I'm going to build a game that's going to be at the top of the app store. We've got this. But the other thing that I think is interesting to point out here is that what Scott said about the million dollars... If I'm going to go out and buy, I think there's also that flip here. If I just build something, it's just going to work. No, you might want to actually think about your, your funding strategy, your, your building. But the other thing that I think the investors here will also um, make a strong statement on is, if I take your money, what am I doing with it? Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go buy my people. I'm going to go market this thing. Uh, I know you'd have opinions around... Uh, I would never fund a company just for your marketing, or what am I actually doing? So I think, and I'm going to kind of switch it up, but with, with that, that being said, what would you do with the money, Scott? How would you handle, if I gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it? Uh, I would put most of it into customer acquisition. Um, you can bet on getting lucky and getting struck, struck by lightning. And quite frankly, Conquer was a very, very lucky startup. I'll say that we got struck by lightning to get the traction that we got. Um, the way that we did it. Um, it should not have worked, but it did. Um, I wouldn't advise anyone to do that. I, I think that a lot of people are, are thinking that, oh, it'll, it'll, it'll go viral. That's another thing never put in your pitch. Um, you're, you're basically betting on getting struck by lightning and nobody's going to bet on Can you. Can we also define this too? User acquisition, I think, could get confused a few different ways, but I think another way to think about it is like, if I were to inject a million dollars into my company, what would I use it for? I'm going to build a sales team. I'm going to market the product that we've tested. It's tried and true. It's gotten beat up, kicked around, but now I'm going to pump money into it. So I think another way of saying user acquisition is like the sales strategy, because you don't have a sales team, correct? Right. right. Uh, yeah, to answer your question, I think if you get a million dollars, uh, spend it like every, like Every dime counts, number one. I've been with companies that have blown through $5 million. Someone said earlier, uh, go out and buy nice office furniture. Well, you don't do that, you know? Um, but I think uh, if you do get a million dollars, it really depends on the company. So I come from capital and uh, equipment intensive businesses. My million dollars is gonna be treated way differently than Scott's gonna be using it on his business. So it really depends on the business that you're building and, and the style. I mean, the digital technology today is way different. The other thing you mentioned, um, you know, build it and they will come. I, 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 early on, I worked for manufacturing companies. And I don't know now, maybe 30, 40 years ago, American industry built it and then they will come. Well, we know what happened to our manufacturing base. Uh, so that's changed a lot. So the reason we talked earlier about finding out what your customer wants, then you build it, is, is currently the, the, the thinking. Um, but anyway, a million dollars, I don't know if I answered your question, is that good enough? No, I, I think that's great. And <laughs> obviously anybody after um, the session can follow up and talk with each of these individuals. Um, Clarence, what would you do with a million? Uh, user acquisition, uh, continue to acquire users. Um, I think like Scott said, that whole, we're going we're gonna to viral is, <laughs> Total bullshit, and it never happens unless you're really, really, really lucky. Um, acquiring users, and I hope before 
you know, anybody takes a million dollars that they can tell, you know, these guys, what is your, you know, cost per acquisition? You know, what does that look like? You know, what is their lifetime value of that customer? Mm -hmm. Hope they can answer all those questions before they take the million. I think any investor that invests a million dollars without you being able to answer those long tail questions um, are just not very smart investors because then I can do the numbers and say, hey, it costs a dollar ninety eight per user over time, you know, the lifetime value is you know, ten thousand dollars and blah blah blah. So Okay. Rick. What would you how would you approach an entrepreneur and said, Hey, you just got a million bucks, what are you what are you gonna do with it? Actually, that's a great question. I ask that one a lot. Um, and you'd be surprised how many people don't really know. <laughs> they say, well, I'm trying to raise two million bucks. Okay, tell me how you're going to spend it. Or I'm trying to raise a million. How are you going to spend it? And they don't really have a good answer. So I think that's a great question. And um, also, it's not only what are you going to spend it on, but when are you going to spend it? Mm. Okay, so if you got a million dollars, that's how I phrase it is, okay, if I write you a check today, what are you going to spend it on? And so what they might spend it on now versus six months from now uh, tells their story too. So that, that would be kind of a bottoms up type of question. If they can answer that well, that would tell me that they've thought it through and really do know that it is two million they want and how they're going to spend it and so forth. So I think that's a great question. Awesome. Any, uh, this is our, we've got to wrap it up here in about three minutes. Uh, but any other follow-up questions from the audience or anybody that has questions about some of the things that we just talked about, the million? Um, I was going to add a, a one, kind of channel my inner Clay Collins, uh, who I've seen on some of these panels, talk about this concept called uh, minimum viable audience. I think that we, all, we a lot of times talk about product a lot, uh, but I think it's really helpful for early entrepreneurs to focus first on growing an audience. If you look at Kickstarter in the recent last six months, there's been some great uh, like record-breaking sales. Uh, the guy who does the oatmeal comic strip, he broke the record for like 200,000 uh, backers because he had an existing audience. I think uh, if you've got, if once you focus on building an audience base, then you don't have to go acquire them, right? You don't have to pay for them. If you, people will buy really shitty products from people they know people they trust. And I think it's a, it's a much cheaper thing to do to build an audience first than it is a, a business or a product, prototyping, stuff like that. Um, one of the questions I had selfishly is just figuring out the timing of, uh, of, in, of when to take money, uh, whether it's pre-revenue, post-revenue, um, when, when's the right time to ask uh, for, uh, that's a tricky part to ask, um, how that helps you get more when you're sitting down at the table, when you have traction, when you have revenue. Um, how does that play into the, into the conversation? Yeah, let's Just do a 30-second well, across. 30-second, th um, I mean, if you asked uh, the question a little differently, Scott and Clarence both said, how would you spend the money? They said user acquisition. Okay, that's a different answer now than it would have been a year ago or two years ago or whatever. So they're at a point where they can use the money to grow the business and truthfully, that's where most investors are looking to get involved. So it's kind of, think of it, they've now built the car and they need mm -hmm. more gas to make it go faster. Mm -hmm. So most investors aren't really that excited about investing in the car, but they are excited about investing in the gasoline and that was what their two answers were. Mm -hmm. Ditto. I, as far as when, I think that, that gets down to your uh, your business plan, your financial projections, and how it's unfolding. I agree with uh, Rick, though, um, as far as where investors like to come in. Also, you're creating more value for your business, so you're in a better position to give up less of your business for the money that's coming in. That's important for you. I don't know that there is a right or wrong time, but I will say from a bootstrapping perspective, and we've been there many times at Conquer, is that you feel like you just can't go anymore without additional capital that you need from an outside investor. Um, you will be surprised how far you can go with without that. Um, we gave up, and we just put our heads down, and we were profitable five months later. Um, that's not a that's not a path that everybody can take, um, but. When you bootstrap and you get beyond kind of the bubble, you'll look back and say, how the hell did we ever do that? Um, and you, you'll think that you had hit the wall several times along the way. 
Awesome. So I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to the JJ Hill and for this opportunity for our panelists and myself to talk to you. Feel free to come up afterwards and talk to each one of us. Um, thank you very much. Round of applause. Thanks. So this is the first panel discussion we're going to have in a series of four. The next one's on May 6th. I'll be sending out information about that. If you did not receive emails about this panel discussion and found out some other form, there's a sign-up sheet on the, the coffee table. So please put your name and email address down. Again, thank you to our panel. It was lovely having you here. Uh, the conversation was great. Thank you to Matt, our facilitator, and to uh, the group of people who helped put this together, including Kathy here, raise your hand, Kathy. Uh, Matt Adesada was on that back in, in the back of the room. Matt Pasiga, um, I'm not sure if I'm, Bob, I know he's here someplace, but thank you to all of you who really helped get this going. <laughs>